Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Launch Space on Microsoft Learn TV. Uh, my name is Brian Benz. I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft. And uh, today I'm joined by Abhishek Gupta, who is an engineer at Microsoft. And we're going to be talking about uh, sustainable AI systems. And actually, this is part of a, a three-part series that we're going to have on sustainable AI. Um, I'll share some details of that towards the end of this session as well. Uh, for those of you who are on Learn TV, great, aka.ms slash Learn TV is the place to share thoughts and ask questions of myself and our guests today. As well, if you're on the Microsoft Developer YouTube channel, Welcome. If you want to ask any questions, though, please do jump over to aka.ms slash learn TV to uh, ask questions. So we'll get going with this. Um, so the title of the session today or the title of the episode is a roadmap to more sustainable AI systems. Uh, and Abhishek, I'll let you introduce yourself and then we'll get going with the uh, with your talk. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me, Brian. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, as, as you mentioned, I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I work in the commercial software engineering group. Uh, we work with uh, Microsoft's biggest clients to help them solve their toughest technical challenges. Uh, most of my work focuses on machine learning, which uh, you know is the future of the world. So I'm always excited, always pumped uh, to be able to you know share my thoughts on AI. Uh, in addition to that, I'm the founder and principal researcher at the Montreal AI Ethics Institute, which is an international nonprofit research institute with the aim to democratize AI ethics literacy. Uh, and I recently started serving as the chair for the standards working group at the Green Software Foundation, uh, which is helping to build standards uh, to bring nuance to how carbon impacts of software are measured and doing so in a manner that is uh, interoperable and actionable. Um, yeah, so uh, right. I always, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, no, and, and and I always uh, love to you know start off with a bit of uh, context uh, because it it helps to place all of the ideas and uh, thoughts that I share today uh, in, into a perspective that'll help you uh, take the uh, take this back, take these ideas, take these insights back, and apply them uh, uh, with with that lens. Uh, so first and foremost, I'm a practitioner. Uh, I, I think a lot of ideas require uh, trial and error in the field to make sure that they're really applicable and effective. So some of the best lessons uh, I feel come from the field. Uh, I'm also a community builder. Uh, the genesis of the Montreal AI Ethics Institute uh, uh, came from uh, me starting a community in Montreal uh, way back in 2017 around the topic of AI ethics. Uh, and w one thing that I realized was a really effective way to build meaningful solutions in this space uh, is to work with a diverse community working with them together because they uh, help to cover our blind spots. Uh, and it, it's also a great opportunity to learn some lessons from others who have solved similar challenges in adjacent fields. And finally, I'm a pragmatist. I think meaningful change requires compromise. Uh, change takes time and uh, it, it's, it's important to have consensus in bringing people together and taking uh, appropriate adjustments uh, and, and making them uh, to incorporate uh, everyone's concerns so that, again, we build a change uh, through consensus in, in a way that uh, includes everybody's uh, voices. Absolutely. So that, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and so I guess, you know, without uh, further ado, uh, here's, here's sort of what we will cover today. Uh, let's, we'll start with talking about uh, the societal and environmental impacts of AI. Uh, then we'll go into the current state of carbon accounting in AI, and we'll wrap it all up with uh, how we can solve uh, some of these issues and, and what actions uh, you can take uh, to help us uh, uh, get there. So well, why are we here? Uh, for, for all of you who are tuning in or who are going to be watching this later, uh, uh, AI has a huge carbon impact, and uh, it also has, you know, related societal concerns. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll give you a few examples as we go uh, deeper into this presentation. Uh, but we can make changes to help mitigate some of these issues. And as a starting point, when we're talking about the environmental impacts of AI, uh, we need to have some accounting, uh, some way of measuring what the carbon impacts are. 
so that that can help us guide our actions. And finally, once you you know have that in place, uh, there are some things that uh, we can do starting this week, hopefully, uh, or whenever you're listening into this, uh, to put these ideas into action. So this is uh, an infographic that was uh, put together by uh, an artist uh, who runs uh, uh, the website Playthink. Dot com and uh, this was uh, done live during a presentation that we did for some work that I did at the Montreal Ethics Institute uh, talking about eco-socially responsible AI systems and it was a novel framework that put together the idea of societal impacts of AI with the environmental impacts of AI uh, uh, cohesively together and of course there's there's a lot on the screen so uh, you know I'd, I'd love to you know field questions on it later or uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can you can pause it if you're watching it later. Take a screen grab and uh, uh, you know uh, dissect the image. But basically, the idea was that we need to harmonize uh, the societal impacts of AI along with the environmental impacts of AI because that gives us a more holistic perspective on uh, how AI systems are designed, developed, and deployed in the world and what impacts they have on us, the humans, uh, for whom we are building these AI systems in the first place. So let's get started with uh, some of the societal and environmental impacts of AI. As a starting point, uh, when we talk about the environmental impacts of AI, to give you a, a, a bit of context, uh, large-scale language models like the GPT-3 uh, that was uh, released by OpenAI, uh, these tend to have a, a very large footprint in terms of not only the money that it costs to train them, uh, the you know uh, associated uh, computing and data infrastructure that's required to build them up and deploy, train and deploy them, uh, but uh, subsequently the environmental impacts that they have, uh, and you you may or may not be surprised to hear this, but uh, for a lot of these large scale language models uh, and and other large scale AI systems, the equivalent. Uh, in terms of carbon footprint can be uh, comparable to several back and forth flights between New York and San Francisco, as an example, which is quite significant if we think about how, uh, uh, you know, what these systems, uh, what these AI systems are built for. Uh, there's also a huge disparity when we think about where these AI systems are trained. So. Uh, to give you an example, if you look at uh, Iowa in the United States and compare that with Quebec in Canada, the difference in the carbon emissions uh, in, in producing one unit of electricity can be 40x. So Iowa in the United States is 40 times worse in terms of the carbon emissions that, it, uh, that are uh, generated uh, to generate one unit of electricity. Uh, and you know, switching over and, and thinking about some of the social inequities that this these kind of large scale models and large scale AI systems inflict, uh, it, we, we exacerbate inequity in terms of access. What does that mean? Uh, when we think about the industry, uh, only those who have access to large scale uh, compute and data infrastructures will be able to build uh, these large systems, these best state-of-the-art systems. And this promotes also exploitative data practices because we enter the paradigm where we need ever larger data sets just to be able to train uh, these systems to have uh, the benefits that come from deploying such large AI systems. In the research arena, what you see is that only the most well-funded labs uh, can work on some of these competitive models and, and publish a top tier uh, conferences. And what that means is that uh, it entrenches these gaps further in the sense that because they're successful, they're the ones who end up receiving uh, most of the funding uh, and, and, and are able to then utilize that to again uh, publish uh, and it enters a, a cyclical process. And finally, in a more general sense, uh, if, if we continue to emphasize larger and larger AI systems without thinking about some of these uh, impacts, uh, the environmental impacts, the compute and data uh, infrastructure impacts, it also creates barriers to entry for new startups, for emerging researchers, especially for those folks who are in developing regions of the world where the high infrastructure costs can be quite prohibitive. The power to make change is in our hands, really. And how do we guide these? How do we guide our actions so that uh, uh, we can we can make some of these changes? Well, if you if you can't measure uh, what's going wrong, you can't fix it. So uh, accounting ends up being an essential diagnostic tool in that sense. And and 
it, granted, it's not the complete solution, but it can definitely guide us in making more informed choices on where and how we should make some of these changes. This also includes uh, things like when we run our tra training uh, for the AI systems, uh, where we run them, and ultimately also assessing what are the benefits uh, that emerge from running these systems and comparing them to the costs. Because sometimes the benefits are quite clear, uh, but the costs not as much because we haven't uh, fully invested yet in terms of accounting for the impacts that these AI systems have. Uh, and you know, when we're thinking about how we can guide these actions, carbon accounting uh, is one of the first ways that acts as a diagnostic that helps us uh, put these uh, actions into context, that helps us uh, uh, put these ideas into practice. And uh, it's important to first get an understanding then of what the current state of carbon accounting is in AI. It is at a very nascent stage today, and there's quite a bit of uh, work that's ahead of us. Uh, and, and there are quite a few challenges, of course, uh, with anything that's nascent. And uh, the issues that, uh, you know, I think are relevant to discuss are uh, data issues and practice issues. Uh, to start off, uh, when we're thinking about, well, how do we do carbon accounting? Uh, it is the one of the first few issues that pop up are the data issues. And uh, to start off, uh, you know, one of the most important aspects when we want to do this kind of uh, analysis and accounting is that there is a lack of richness in the input data sources today. Uh, some of the data sources are quite static. And uh, especially in places that have renewable energy mixes, having these static tables makes it really hard uh, to get an accurate enough picture in terms of uh, what the carbon impact is and hence uh, makes it difficult for you to act on them. Uh, and, and these uh, are also, uh, the, the statically published numbers also make it difficult for you to have uh, a real-time action that you can take because these are uh, perhaps, you know, uh, lagging uh, by weeks, by months, and sometimes they're just yearly figures. Uh, and uh, often when we talk about richness, the richness in data sources is only present in places like the United States, uh, in Western Europe, and uh, uh, and generally in North America. And in, in, in other parts of the world where we don't have this richness, again, act actionability of this, these data sources becomes quite difficult. Then there's also a lack of consensus on measurement methodologies. So there are different pieces of literature that suggest you know, different ways of measuring carbon emissions, different ways of measuring energy consumption. Uh, and, and, you know, these can uh, range uh, uh, from, you know, measuring floating point operations to the direct energy that's drawn from uh, the sockets, uh, uh, if, if it's a plugged in device or from batteries, uh, or, you know, measuring the uh, energy consumed by the screen, etc. And there are many different ways that uh, these measurements are done. Uh, and, and because of a lack of consensus, uh, what ends up happening is that we, we lose uh, comparability. And each of these approaches, of course, come with their own pros and cons, uh, but none of them at the moment address uh, whether, uh, whether and how each of these approaches are effective in uh, affecting or uh, uh, you know, instigating behavior change on the part of developers and designers. So let's also uh, look at some of the practice issues that uh, exist in this space. And to give you an example, uh, if, if you're a practitioner like I am, uh, I'm sure you hit perhaps or uh, should hit, must hit, or, or probably hit documentation or exiting your natural workflow when you're writing code to have to go and input information somewhere else, which is why we start to have uh, tools uh, that pull out our inline documentation and make them uh, you know, presentable in an HTML markdown, et cetera, format that makes it pretty to look at later uh, with all the cross references and everything. Um, similarly, what we're seeing today uh, when it comes to uh, doing um, uh, accounting, carbon accounting in AI systems, uh, a lot of the tools uh, started in a place where they were web-based. What that means is that you had to actually go out into a different website, enter information about what uh, uh, you know uh, configuration of a virtual machine you're using, uh, where the data center is located, who is the cloud provider. You know, it could be Azure, it could be AWS, it could be GCP. Um, and then it would spit out some numbers, and then you would have to take those numbers and, and you know, uh, capture them as a part of uh, your AI lifecycle, basically. Uh, and and 
obviously you already see that there is uh, quite a bit of friction there. You have to exit your natural workflow uh, uh, to, to go and input that information, which is never fun. And uh, what started to happen then now is that we're moving towards code-based tools. And so these code-based tools are basically uh, quite naturally integrated into our workflows. Uh, to give you an example, there's a tool called Code Carbon, uh, which uh, integrates in line within your machine learning code uh, to capture some of these uh, essential metrics. And uh, it also now has integration with Common ML, meaning that uh, you have the entire AI lifecycle um, sort of perspective from, from an MLOps perspective, if you want to think of it that way, uh, that makes it uh, more practical uh, and, and more natural. And, uh, you know, finally, I think there's, there's this other aspect, which is that this is still perceived as an esoteric practice. So sustainable software engineering, and more specifically thinking about sustainability in AI systems, is still something that isn't quite a practice uh, 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 you know, as as pervasively as it should be, and uh, you, you know, you get that evidence from uh, a lot of the GitHub repositories for these uh, tools, and even anecdotally, if you speak with uh, practitioners and uh, your colleagues, you'll see that this is still a novel idea, and so there's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done there. So, what can we do to solve these issues? What can we do? Uh, to to instigate the change to to enact some of some of these uh, ideas and practice uh, so that we can actually start to move towards building more sustainable AI systems. Uh, so there are four areas that require work. There's uh, data and research, there's standardization and measurement, there's practice, and there's tooling. So on the data and research front, uh, there are two key ideas that we need to think about. One being better data aggregation and uh, collection. And second is research into methods that uh, can better distribute uh, uh, the carbon impact, uh, as it were, when we're thinking about AI systems. So, uh, you know, we already spoke a little bit about uh, this problem of uh, data and the richness of data, the quality of data that's available. Uh, so when we're talking about better data aggregation, uh, currently uh, uh, what we need to uh, move towards is having a uh, higher granularity in the data and making it more real time because that'll lead to more actionable uh, insights and, and subsequently trigger change. Um, and this is especially true for regions that are outside uh, uh, of North America and, uh, and Europe, as I said, where uh, the this kind of data is, is more uh, available, more accessible, uh, in other parts of the world, not so much. And, and we need to push uh, towards making that happen. Uh, and if perhaps standardization in this context is, is one part of the problem, but more so if we start to demand uh, that we want this data and we want to use this data, uh, perhaps uh, it will trigger uh, market forces in terms of you know, uh, spurring on new startups or government initiatives that uh, make this data available to us. Standardization uh, uh, and, and uh, measurement is, is, is something that's uh, uh, important to think about in the sense that uh, we also want to be able to compare, uh, uh, you know, apples to apples. So when we were talking about some of the metrics that are put out and how uh, it, it makes it really difficult if, if if people have different ways of measuring the carbon impact and you as an end consumer, even if you're a developer choosing to pick a cloud provider, choosing to pick a particular platform or a tool, if you can't make uh, equivalent comparisons, uh, your choices are not well informed. And so that's something that we need to uh, start to push towards and consensus building in this uh, place requires empirical evidence. So we need to try out different methodologies against uh, these uh, you know, uh, targeting specific architectures and systems and then uh, seeing what the difference is and uh, understanding what the real carbon uh, impacts are so that we can pick methodologies that actually align with uh, our, our goals of uh, achieving uh, sustainable AI systems. There's also this notion of uh, building certifications, uh, and, and certifications are important because it gives you a third-party uh, verified source uh, of uh, the claims that are made by, again, you know, different cloud providers, tools, platforms, in terms of what their carbon impacts are. So to get a better understanding and to be able to verify those claims, uh, having certification would certainly help. Um, and this is going to be especially useful to uh, folks who are downstream who are going to be using off-the-shelf systems and who are not developing their own systems uh, so that they have a verifiable standardized way of assessing uh, the sustainability of these AI systems. 
So tooling uh, is is quite an important aspect. Uh, you know, as practitioners, uh, tools are uh, a, a huge part of our lives. Uh, one of the things where, uh, you know, when we were talking about uh, the lack of nativity uh, in terms of uh, the workflows as it relates to carbon accounting, uh, we need to better map the needs of our practitioners today. So getting an understanding for what is it that uh, triggers us to adopt a tool and what is it that uh, uh, pushes us to uh, retain and continue to use the tool. And so uh, the movement from web-based to code-based tooling uh, was one step in that direction, but we also need to understand what are the other levers uh, that we can uh, we can uh, uh, utilize uh, that will trigger this sort of behavior change on the part of consumers, on the part of developers, designers, anybody who is involved in the AI lifecycle. Also, the results uh, that are uh, emitted or that are outputted from these tools need to be actionable. So just saying uh, you know, that you emitted uh, 25 grams of uh, CO2 equivalent uh, as a part of uh, uh, an application that you built and ran uh, doesn't tell you what you can do to mitigate that or how you can change that. And that's an important aspect because uh, behavior change is really uh, the key aspect that we want to target when we're trying to build sustainable AI systems. Without that, all of these initiatives, all of these ideas are just theoretical and they don't actually uh, lead to action. Uh, and, and that's that's the, the key aspect here. And so again, you know, more nativity in, in the tooling, moving towards code-based tooling is, is a great step. Uh, that will help us uh, achieve that. And finally, well, we're practitioners, right? So uh, we, we we would love to put these ideas into practice. So how do we go about doing that? Um, as a starting point, uh, the, these practices, these ideas are still quite esoteric. What that means is that we need to um, uh, normalize this idea. We need to engage in a degree of evangelism uh, to normalize this practice. And that can start with a few simple actions like making these uh, as you know soft requirements for conference publications at top tier machine learning conferences. So we, we already saw this trend start off at NeurIPS uh, in 2019, where they introduced uh, broader impact statements, which made it uh, a mandatory part of your submission to talk about the societal impacts of your AI systems. Similarly, having something about the environmental impacts of your AI systems, your research, um, could be a great step in that direction. It could also be applied to uh, journal submissions, uh, thinking about uh, integrating these ideas into course curricula when AI is uh, taught uh, to students. Um, and uh, finally, uh, you know, having more articles uh, in, in popular media can be another avenue that just exposes people to the idea that uh, thinking about the environmental impacts of your AI system is actually an important consideration. And it's not just uh, something that's, uh, uh, you know, a niche uh, area or a niche topic. So well, what can you do next? I mean, uh, all of these challenges and everything that we spoke about seem to be quite uh, uh, big and, and sprawling. Uh, and, and of course, you know, we, we chip away at these problems uh, piece by piece, trying to get to uh, a state in the ecosystem where uh, we, we truly are progressing towards sustainable AI systems. But as I said in the beginning, uh, hopefully there are some things that you can start to uh, take action on this week if you're listening in live or Whenever you're listening in, uh, you know, hopefully the next day uh, you can start to take some actions on this. Um, the first part uh, or the first thing that you can do is to share these ideas. So uh, start talking to your colleagues um, and, and other practitioners in your community uh, about sustainable AI systems, about sustainability uh, in AI. And also clarifying to them this idea that when we're talking about sustainable AI systems, we're talking about uh, not not the typical um, idea that comes to mind when we think about these two things together, which is applying AI to solve climate change problems. Yes, uh, AI has a huge role to play there, but uh, the impact that AI systems in, in their uh, design, development, training, deployment uh, uh, have, uh, the environmental impact that they have, that's an important consideration and uh, being cognizant of that, uh, normalizing that is an important part. Um, Second, you can already start to put in place some uh, instrumentation and telemetry to gather data 
about uh, the potential carbon impact of the applications that you're building, the AI systems that you're building. And there are a whole host of great resources. Uh, you'll see a link uh, pop up to that uh, on the uh, show notes page uh, that we have for uh, today's session. Um, there are quite a few good resources there in terms of um, uh, tools and operating system level tools uh, that help you monitor the uh, carbon emissions of uh, uh, the machine learning jobs that you're running in your cloud platforms, etc. Uh, and finally, start thinking about designing your software solutions, your AI systems uh, in a carbon aware and in a carbon efficient manner. And again, uh, uh, there are quite a few resources on the uh, links that are on the show notes page that you can go and visit uh, that will guide you through uh, that process and, and how you can design solutions that are uh, indeed carbon aware and carbon uh, efficient. So here's what we covered today in, in a nutshell. We spoke about the societal and environmental impacts of AI. Uh, we spoke about the current state of carbon accounting in AI, and we looked at a few ways that we can uh, solve these issues and also uh, a few steps that you can take uh, immediately uh, to get started on your journey uh, towards building more uh, sustainable AI systems. The power to make greener AI systems really is in your hands, and 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 I don't say this lightly. It's 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 our collective duty. It's our collective action that will really uh, move us to an ecosystem where we have uh, greener, more sustainable AI systems. And I, I strongly encourage you to uh, embark on that journey, to ask questions, uh, as hopefully uh, you will today uh, in our live session, uh, but also. Uh, you know, reach out to us through uh, our, our Twitter, our, um, our, our emails, uh, ask your questions. We're more than happy to help. Uh, I, I really, really believe that it's something that we can all work on uh, together. So here, uh, just to give you a few ongoing initiatives and, and ways to work with me and my team uh, and the Green Software Foundation as an example. Uh, one of the things, uh, if you're more interested in, in doing a deep dive, looking at some of the tools uh, uh, as it relates to carbon accounting in AI systems, uh, there is an article on the Microsoft Sustainable Software Engineering blog. Again, the link for that is on the show notes page uh, titled The Current State of Affairs and a Roadmap for Effective Carbon uh, Accounting Tooling in uh, AI that you can take a look at. Um, there's also the Green Software Foundation that I mentioned, which is a nonprofit uh, with a mission to create a trusted ecosystem of people's standards tooling and best practices for building green software. Uh, as I mentioned, I uh, lead the uh, standards working group where we're trying to build uh, a nuanced approach to uh, carbon uh, measurement. And uh, we're developing a software carbon intensity standard with the goal uh, of uh, making something that's standardized, that's interoperable, that helps you achieve um, uh, your sustainable software engineering goals. Uh, and finally, I'd also like to highlight uh, the State of AI Ethics report that's published by the Montreal AI Ethics Institute. Uh, this latest volume, uh, depending on, well, when you're watching this show, if you're watching it live now, uh, was uh, released a few days ago. Uh, it has a chapter on AI and environment that tackles both sides of the interpretation of AI and environment, meaning it looks at how AI can be applied to addressing climate change, but also, uh, as we saw in uh, today's session, uh, how we can build sustainable AI systems. And finally, uh, if you ever have any questions uh, beyond today's session, uh, obviously I encourage you to ask questions right now, uh, but if you ever have any questions, uh, you can uh, feel free to send me a quick email. Uh, there are other ways to reach me through, uh, the, through my website, uh, but also uh, you can just tweet at me uh, at my Twitter handle. Uh, delighted to have had the opportunity to share uh, my thoughts with you uh, folks today and uh, looking forward to all the questions that you have. Hey, great talk. Yeah, I mean, really, uh, you know, for me as an old school sort of software engineer, I'm always wondering what exactly sustainable engineering, sustainable AI means, you know, it's sort of, uh, uh, something that um, that is maybe a little bit of a nebulous term, so that's really, really great. That actually clarifies a lot, so thank you very much for that. Uh, I do want to show a couple things on my screen here. Um, Abhishek was referencing our show page at ACAMS slash the Launch Space Sustainable uh, One. Uh, you can find that info that he re referenced there. Uh, down here, we've got a couple of links and a few other things and some info about the um, 
the Montreal AI Ethics Institute and a few other places there, including Abhishek's uh, website and some other things. So please do uh, check that out. Now, this is a live broadcast, so if you have any questions, please do ask us at ACAMS slash LearnTV. But uh, also, um, we have the ability to leave comments on this show page, and somebody did leave some comments a while ago. So let's start with these uh, questions, and then we'll take some other questions as they come in. Um, the first one, I guess, is when is your company using, uh, when your company is using cloud services, uh, who's responsible for that carbon footprint? Is it you or the cloud provider who is actually providing the services? So that's an interesting uh, question, right? And I think uh, yeah. it's it's one of the first uh, uh, struggles that we face when we're trying to think about, well, how do we account for the carbon that we emit? Uh, and right. it really has to do with uh, organizational boundaries, uh, which is the, uh, you know, approach used by the greenhouse uh, 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 the GHE protocol. But what's uh, perhaps more interesting, and it's something that we've been uh, discussing at the Green Software Foundation, is to think of the uh, the scope and the boundary of the product or the software that you're building, rather than the organization. So the way the question is phrased here, uh, I guess uh, 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 our viewer uh, is is asking whether it's, it's an organizational thing, whether it would be isolated to just the cloud provider or them. Uh, mm. I think when we think about it in the sense uh, of, of it cutting in the sense that uh, it's really uh, emissions that are emerging uh, by you developing and deploying an application and the choices that you are making. So it's a, it's a consequentialist approach rather than an attributional approach. An attributional approach would be where we would, uh, uh, you know, quite squarely attribute uh, the, the carbon emissions to organization X, Y, and Z, uh, versus being consequentialist in the sense saying that uh, by developing this application, by deploying this application, by having users uh, make queries against it or some sort of service, uh, it, it has marginal emissions as a part of that. And, and so really thinking about that uh, makes it a lot more concrete uh, and also makes it more actionable in terms of uh, trying to reduce your carbon footprint rather than just thinking about uh, what is the energy mix that's coming into the data center. Of course, that's a huge part of it, but what are the actions that you as a developer can take uh, come from this uh, consequentialist uh, approach and thinking about the scope or the boundary of your product uh, or service that you're building? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, really, it's a it is a collaborative process, right? A collaborative approach that you need to take. Really, the it, you, you uh, decide what services you're going to have as, as a customer, and uh, those services uh, should be sustainable or at least uh, minimal. And then the company itself. I got to say, in terms of having the cloud in, in in general, you know, when you compare that to on-prem data centers or um, co-location services or things like that, you're already sort of ahead of the game because you're working with a shared environment, right? You're not working with uh, independent cooling systems and independent, you don't have to have those redundant systems for uh, a million different customers. You can have all of that combined and shared inside one cloud uh, platform, one cloud data center. It's, uh, it's definitely, so you're sort of already ahead of the game in my opinion. <laughs> Oh, no, absolutely, Brian. And I think, you know, an, an important thing to think about there is that, uh, you know, data centers are optimized for uh, uh, for, for all of these things, right? So they, they take mm -hmm. on that uh, uh, expertise that one would re require to engineer those solutions away from you. So they abstract it away from you. As mm -hmm. an example, our Azure sustainability page actually talks about a lot of the uh, initiatives and efforts that we have uh, going on in terms of uh, how we, um, uh, you know, how we uh, take these uh, things into account, how we structure our cooling, uh, what are our power purchase agreements, what are, uh, are the energy mixes going into our data centers and, and other optimizations that we've put in place. Sure, I'm showing that on my screen now. I've got the uh, sustainability. If you just search on Azure sustainability, uh, you'll find this page and uh, part of the page is what I'm showing now. Some uh, articles here on uh, Abhishef's article on current state of affairs and roadmap for effective carbon accounting tooling in AI. So that kind of thing is, is out there and it's already prepared for you and ready to go. So that's great. Yeah. Um, the next one. So there was another question there. Um, 
the question is more about metrics. Uh, what metrics should be used to report carbon footprints um, if it's not in your current location or your current com country? Uh, that's that's uh, I guess that's a that's it's more of a what is how long is a piece of string? But I, I'll let you take the question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and and. So sorry, you're reading the second question there in terms of yeah. The so um, when what about if those services are executing not in your not in the country that your company is in? Uh, what kind of metrics did you use to report the carbon footprint? I know you talked a little generally about metrics uh, during uh, your talk, but uh, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that sort of reporting carbon footprints. What would be sort of the standards maybe in Europe versus U.S. or Asia and things like that? Or should you always have sort of a compatible version of that metric? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I think uh, I have a bit of a, uh, I, I wouldn't say bias, but a preference towards standardized uh, measurement methodologies and, uh, you know, interoperability and comparability in metrics. So as, as much as possible, if we can harmonize and have translations for those metrics, uh, that is uh, the preferred way to go. Uh, I, I don't know if they're asking about specific uh, units uh, or, or perhaps, uh, uh, but uh, you know, the standard way to do that is in terms of grams or kilograms of CO2 equivalents. Uh, and that really is, uh, well, what is the, um, uh, you know, equivalent amount of CO2 that would be emitted in terms of, uh, you know, whenever the units of electricity are are uh, consumed, uh, are and and you know, as a part of their generation, what was emitted, and you know, when we're thinking about these metrics, I think the other important thing is uh, making sure that you're you're measuring the right parts uh, of your application. Uh, so it's not just about um, checking off some boxes that uh, help you meet uh, the requirements uh, as by, mandated by law. I think. Perhaps that's what uh, law metrics is about, uh, but it's also really trying to follow this in spirit rather than just the letter. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, a great example of that it go is Goodhart's law, right? Where you have this metric and you try to game it just in the interest of achieving that metric, but then you forget the spirit behind it. And I think for anybody who's interested in sustainable software engineering uh, writ large, uh, it's really more so about the spirit than the letter. So uh, metrics are, you know, one part uh, of that. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when the numbers aren't really established, you can always make up, uh, not make up, but you can always get your number to where you want it to be, right? But uh, uh, yeah, I 100% agree. I mean, it's the spirit of the, uh, it's the spirit of the sustainability concept versus the uh, actual number, the letter of the law to, to paraphrase, absolutely. Um, and then the last question was, I think this is mostly answered overall by this session, but how can your company be green if it's using AI systems? So I, you know, that pretty much is covered by this session. And there's going to be two other sessions that we have in September and October that will cover this as well. So uh, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that or we can move to some other questions too. Yeah. I mean, if there are other questions as well, I think yeah. uh, we sort of fairly covered this uh, during the session. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's just the overall session topic. Uh, so, um, oh, Panzan, I hope that answered your question. So we'll move on to some others. So um, what happens when data centers are running 100% on renewable energy all the time? Uh, you know, is that basically something that you need to calculate in your carbon footprint? Right. And and that's that's always an interesting question in the sense that, uh, you know, one might think that, oh, if the data center is running on 100% renewable energy, well, does it matter? I mean, we, we should use as much of it as possible because, well, nothing's nothing's really uh, making an impact, right? And, and the truth is uh, honestly a bit more complicated in the sense that uh, even when you have a data center that's running 100% on renewable energy, it's pulling in renewable energy from the grid. So the, the entire grid is interconnected, of course. And what that means is that uh, if any time, uh, you know, demand, for example, peaks elsewhere in the grid, if you have, uh, you know, taken up some portion of that renewable energy, if you go beyond that where you need more uh, uh, energy that needs to be consumed, uh, the default way uh, to ramp up energy production is through what, what are called peaker plants. And peaker plants are typically coal-fired or gas-fired plants because they're quite quick to uh, ramp up and ramp down compared to things like uh, 
while wind and solar, which are, uh, mm -hmm. well, they're dependent on the whims of nature. If the wind's blowing, you got energy. If, if it's not, well, too bad, unless you have batteries to store it. But of course, when we're talking about the data center, you don't have batteries that store uh, that sort of energy. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I guess to answer uh, that question, uh, we should always still design for uh, uh, carbon efficiency and carbon awareness in the sense that uh, minimizing your carbon footprint, even when you have a data center running on 100% renewable energy, uh, is still a very, very important consideration and doesn't absolve you from uh, having to think about it just because uh, it's it's on renewable energy. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, the other thing I can think of, I, I actually happen to live in uh, Las Vegas out here in the middle of the desert. And uh, this kind of thing comes up all the time in normal life here. And that's that, uh, yeah, even though the energy that you're consuming, we have these amazing, huge solar panel arrays outside of town. I mean, you drive literally for miles and they're still going, they're still still out there. Um, but even so, you still have to conserve energy in the sense that when there are peak times, uh, it draws from other sources and not only that, but the output, right? So the output of the, uh, there is an impact in terms of the environment's uh, when the output goes, you know, the, the heat that gets generated, the um, uh, everything that sort of comes out of that, right? The wear and tear on the service and the batteries and everything like that has to be maintained. So as much as you can use uh, sustainable practices and keep things uh, economical, I guess, uh, it's, it's a great idea to do that anyway, even if you're running on carbon uh, neutral platforms. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. You gotta, gotta consider the outputs as well, I think. Um, yeah, the other uh, question. So um, what about the size of a carbon impact of data centers? Is it, you know, big compared to other industries, other industry activity that's out there? Uh, do you have sort of some relative uh, comparisons? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, data center uh, consumption of energy is is just consistently uh, going up over uh, over time, right? And and it does end up being a significant uh, chunk of emissions. I I forget the exact numbers, but I uh, believe it's comparable to the aviation industry or even more. Uh, but don't quote me on that. I uh, we're live here. This is not a real show, so I don't have uh, the exact numbers in front of me. But but it is sizable. Right. And one of the things that's also interesting and, you know, perhaps as a follow on uh, that usually gets asked as well, uh, how big is AI uh, as, as a chunk of data center operations? Because data centers are, of course, used to run non AI products and services as well. Um, and it's uh, that share uh, has also been going up and that share has been going up quite rapidly in the sense that uh, the the intensity uh, that's required, uh, the computational intensity of AI systems is just so high that every time we choose to implement and, and deploy AI solutions, uh, it's it's much more carbon, uh, sorry, compute intensive compared to traditional software, which mm -hmm. means that we're, we're uh, over time just, um, you know, uh, increasing the share uh, of uh, AI uh, jobs, uh, be that inference or training, uh, as a part of uh, the data center, uh, you know, compute consumption, uh, and and data centers itself as a whole, um, you know, uh, not talking about uh, you know purchase of uh, renewable energy credits and and other sort of market measures that are used to offset uh, some of these um, carbon emissions, uh, they're still uh, quite a significant chunk uh, of of the sort of global output of uh, of carbon emissions. Sure, absolutely. Um, what about, you know, when you talk about uh, carbon emissions specifically, um, how accurate is the impact measurements that we have uh, from systems now? Are they, uh, what would be the accuracy would you estimate? So the accuracy actually ends up varying quite a bit, right? And uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> the, the link that we had uh, showed, uh, uh, you know, a few minutes uh, ago on the Azure uh, the, the sustainable software engineering blog actually has a few articles that point out uh, the wide variability that you get, for example, when trying to measure uh, how much energy is being consumed by a screen, right? Yeah. So your phone screen, your laptop screen, et cetera. Um, how much energy is being consumed by your CPU, by mm -hmm. the GPU? And all of these measurements still have quite a degree of uh, variability, especially when it comes to um, 
you know, how we go about measuring them, uh, what are the tooling uh, and, and pieces of software that are layered on top of that tooling to gather those uh, metrics, right? And uh, when it comes to, well, what is the degree of accuracy? To me, it's more important that we get the right directionality in terms of these metrics. So uh, much more so than saying, hey, we're down to, you know, 1% uh, of error in terms of what the actual uh, energy consumption was. Uh, even if you're within 20%, and, and I'm making these numbers as we go along, but even if you're within 20%, if it triggers you to take an action towards becoming more sustainable, so that directionality, that is more important than being able to arrive at the most precise estimate and then you know putting your hands up and saying, oh, great, we did a great job with measurement. Job done, let's go home, right? And not taking mm -hmm. any action. So, so it's more important that... Um, any and all data that we get or that we gather uh, is presented in an actionable way. So the accuracy, I guess, in that sense is uh, not that much of an issue. Uh, and, and this is to contrast with the notion of granularity that I spoke about before when we're mm -hmm. doing this sort of uh, data gathering. The granularity actually helps you be actionable, right? Helps yeah. you be more real time versus saying that, oh, you know, you just had 1% error. We had a 15% error, 20% error. Sure. You know, as long as we're able to act on it, I think that's the more important aspect. Absolutely. It's good to it's good to establish a baseline using these metrics and then try and measure how you're doing. Are you going up? Are you going down? Absolutely. That's a that's a great way to go. Um, in terms of uh, how do we actually influence change in this area? Uh, are regulations the way to go or is it more personal responsibility or what's your opinion on where we should go with future accountability? Well, I think, <laughs> I think, I think it starts with personal responsibility because that's the easiest. That's the first step. That's the step that you can take today, tomorrow, next week. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, regulation is, is a, is a much slower burn, but it's also quite effective in the sense that it, for those actors who don't want to act on this. So Microsoft's, of course, been fantastic in terms of being quite forward with our approaches to sustainability, sharing our findings, sharing our learnings, as we're doing today itself, uh, uh, as, as you know, one initiative. Uh, but for other actors who are perhaps not as incentivized or, or for whom this is not the top priority, that's also another aspect. It's perhaps not an intention, but it's just not a top priority. Regulation makes that mandatory and, and really pushes everybody uh, towards that direction. And one of the things that I you know, caution uh, about when talking about regulation is that uh, we need to be careful in terms of regulating for the right things and uh, you know, articulating the right things that need to be measured. Um, and, and this comes from the fact that, you know, when we're talking about the GHG protocol as an example in terms of how we <laughs> assess carbon, and uh, when we start to apply that to software, we, hmm. we start to see that there are a lot of problems, right? What's the, what's the GHG protocol? Sorry, sorry The GHG protocol, so the greenhouse gases uh, protocol, oh. that's the standard for uh, measuring uh, uh, the carbon impacts. And, and so that's applied to, you know, literally everything when we talk about the UN sustainable uh, right. development goals relating to environment. Um, but, you know, if, if we come back and, and think about what is the degree of applicability of the GHG protocol to uh, software, it starts to run into a lot of issues uh, because of the way it considers, uh, you know, attributing uh, these carbon emissions to a particular organization. And, and we spoke about this, uh, you know, uh, a little while ago where we talked about the scope and the um, uh, sort of boundaries for how, uh, you know, software is, uh, software doesn't just reside within, um, uh, you know, within uh, an organization, right? I mean, it, it can it can cut across. In fact, uh, just uh, a few hours ago in a conversation at the Green Software Foundation, uh, someone brought up an, a very interesting uh, stat that the uh, total carbon uh, emissions, if we thought about Windows, is actually larger than all of the carbon emissions from Microsoft. Huh. Yeah, makes sense. Millions of right? laptops, yeah. Just Windows, Windows everywhere, right? Yeah. And, uh, uh, but then that that shows you uh, if if we would apply the GAG uh, to this, it it makes it incredibly difficult to think about well how should we, uh, you know who should we attribute it to who's responsible for making the change, and instead thinking about the consequentialist approach, 
starts to make it you know a little more actionable for who can act on that information and what kind of change they can enact and and so you know to come back to your question then uh, when we're talking about regulation i think it's important that we have uh, first a, a, a meaningful and adequate understanding of what the real challenges in the field are and what's actually required to create meaningful change before um, you know sort of jumping ahead and trying to regulate stuff uh, because you can you can either end up under regulating over regulating or regulating the wrong thing and that's right. um, that's always a problem so right Great. Well, um, just to remind everyone, this is a live broadcast. If you want to join us, ask any questions, uh, share any comments, aka.ms slash learn TV is where you go. And uh, happy to take your questions and comments uh, on the air. Um, one other question I have for you, how do we split up responsibility between uh, developers and platform owners? So that old uh, dev and, uh, uh, you know, dev and ops team, uh, how do you split up the um, the responsibility between the dev team and the ops team for who should be responsible for what part of uh, sustainability initiatives? So that's that's an interesting question in the sense that uh, I think responsibility lies on on all the stakeholders who are part of that life cycle, right? And, 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 sure. and what I mean by that is, so let's say we talk about Azure, right? Let's talk about Azure uh, ML Studio as an example, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when we're talking about that as, as a platform where other developers can come in, build their you know, AI applications, do you know, whatever they got to do with it, um, a part, the, the developer's choice uh, or the developer's responsibility is in being smart about picking the right solution within the suite of the Azure ecosystem. So uh, maybe, maybe you're better off picking one of our cognitive services, which you know, have pre-trained models. Uh, there, you know, you don't have to train your model from scratch, and you get pretty good accuracy for whatever task that you're trying to work on. What, or maybe you're building a custom solution, in which case you do need Azure uh, ML Studio or or some other uh, custom offering. So that's that's on the part of the uh, developer. The the other uh, side of the 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 coin is well, the the folks who are designing these suite of services on the platform itself. So what are the optimizations that we can uh, create in there? For example, um, you know, uh, for, for some of our pre-trained services, maybe there are common queries that those pre-trained services get uh, that we can cache so that, um, uh, so that you don't have to run uh, inference again and again, or you don't have to train models again and again. And so those are the kind of, I think, uh, splits between uh, responsibilities that we can have. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Um, what about other companies? What are they doing uh, uh, in terms of uh, implementing things like this? Um, so, so there, there's uh, there's quite a bit of work going around, right? Um, uh, for example, uh, uh, our our friends over at Google, uh, they've got uh, some work going on in terms of uh, smart job scheduling across uh, their entire set of data centers, and, and they published that paper uh, recently, uh, where they they think about uh, the carbon intensity in different regions, and then they schedule and dispatch jobs uh, based on uh, what would be the most appropriate or green uh, region to deploy uh, uh, that job in terms of the compute that it would uh, consume. Sure. Uh, yeah. We also have organizations like ThoughtWorks uh, who are building uh, uh, you know, generic uh, tooling that helps uh, uh, capture some of these metrics from cloud providers like AWS, GCP, Azure, uh, and, and uh, compute uh, carbon impact from them. We also have, um, you know, other uh, organizations like uh, BCG that partnered with Mila, so Yasho Benjo's lab in, in Montreal, uh, to build Code Carbon, which was one of the tools that I mentioned in terms of, uh, you know, doing inline, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, accounting as a part of your uh, AI lifecycle. Um, and so, so you have various organizations that are coming at it, coming at these uh, problems from different angles. And uh, uh, I think, you know, as I said towards the end of my presentation, the uh, power really is in our hands. The power is in our collective action. So, uh, the more organizations we have looking at this, uh, the more creativity we apply to solving these challenges, the better it is. Cool. Cool. Um, great. And, you know, the impact is, is self-evident there. Um, uh, Karen just asked a question. Uh, what can consumers look for to support sustainability through purchasing decisions? Like, How could they make 
better decisions that would support sustainability. We got to walk the talk, right? Uh, in in the sense of as consumers, I think uh, our, our dollars are king in, in terms of uh, shaping the market, in terms of guiding the market. So if you, let's say, you know, we take the example of cloud providers. So if you as a consumer, uh, uh, and in this case, a consumer being the developer, chooses one cloud platform consistently over the other uh, mm. because of their sustainability initiatives, it is a strong indicator to the other cloud platforms to pull up their socks and get into the game and, and start uh, implementing sustainability. So as consumers, I think uh, really the first step is asking questions, asking the hard questions about uh, what uh, you know, what is the carbon impact of the device that you're purchasing, right? So if you're purchasing a Surface Book from Microsoft, ask us what is the carbon impact of that. If you're consuming services from Azure, ask us what is the carbon impact of that. And as you do that, you become a savvy, well-informed consumer, and hopefully you spread that awareness with your colleagues, your community, uh, towards leading everybody to uh, make some of those, uh, you know, smarter decisions when it comes to sustainable uh, software, but also any sustainable product. Right, there's one thing I wanted to show. Um, that was great. Uh, thank you, Karen, for your question, by the way. I um, hope that uh, covers it. I did want to say one thing. Um, if we show my screen right now, I'll show you uh, on the Azure Sustainability website. So if you just search for Azure Sustainability, it's a long link. Um, you can click on this sustainability calculator here and it'll give you some details uh, on uh, what you do to determine your impact and how you can actually take actions as well. So that's kind of a cool thing uh, related to that question. So uh, definitely something you can look into as well. Yeah, um, other than that, you know, what are the, what are the uh, when we're actually putting together these initiatives, uh, to what extent are climate subject matter experts involved um, at Microsoft and elsewhere as well? So at Microsoft, we're, we're blessed to have uh, quite a few really, really knowledgeable people. I mean, I, I learn every day from, uh, from our colleagues in terms of uh, what really matters when we're trying to measure carbon impact and how we should go about doing it, what are the pros and cons, which I think, you know, as I was saying, is, is quite important when we're thinking about even, you know, crafting standards, thinking about regulations. Uh, but for the most part uh, today, what we, uh, you know, see in the state of the ecosystem is that uh, you know, some of the work happens in isolation. And once that work has been, you know, developed, built, we start and go and consult the subject matter experts. So as to say, asking them questions once we build something instead, and this is, you know, I guess a problem with many, many domains, uh, having those subject matter experts sit with you day one, as you're thinking, conceiving the solution, as you're conceiving metrics, as you're conceiving tooling standards, whatever, uh, that will give you the edge, that will make you really effective. And I think that's uh, that's what we need to do is to, uh, you know, be, be open in asking questions, be humble in asking questions. You know, I'm a software engineer, I, you know, write uh, uh, machine learning code. Uh, I uh, educate myself about sustainability. I am by no means an expert. So I always look to, uh, you know, my generous colleagues uh, in, you know, uh, asking questions and they're quite uh, generous with their time and answering my questions. So don't hesitate to ask questions and uh, get involved with subject matter experts as early as possible. Awesome. Well, that was my question. I was going to ask you, uh, you know, what you've done uh, to implement these and how it impacts your uh, your work life and your home life even. Um, so I think we can leave it there. I think we're going to wrap up right there. Uh, thanks to everyone online who uh, shared their questions. Uh, and thanks to Abhishek. Uh, it was great uh, coverage. You know, I always, uh, it's, it's one of those new things that I think everyone needs to know about. And uh, we're going to actually have uh, two more sessions in September and October. If you watch the website that we have for the show, aka.ms slash the launch space, uh, you'll get more information about those shows as we put together the uh, details and publish them. Uh, but we are having one September 23rd and October 19th, I believe, as well. The next one is a Green Software Engineering with Bill Johnston and Scott Chamberlain. Uh, here at Microsoft as well. So that's going to be a little bit more detail. And then we'll have another one in October as well, 
uh, that'll cover some more sustainability topics. So thanks again, Abhishek. Uh, great show. And if you do have any more questions, please go to our show page, aka.ms slash the Launch Space Sustainable One, where we have Abhishek's uh, contact info and uh, all the details that we've shared in the show today. So thank you very much.